Okay, hi there. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a rant, if you like. Uh, it's regarding the case of the uh, lady who was in the uh, British Army gunner uh, who faced uh, racial discrimination and also uh, got a payout uh, on what she'd suffered. Um, before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience or some of my experiences in the British Army and racism. Um, I joined a long time ago. And uh, I was 16 when I joined. All the lessons I've learned, all the big lessons I've learned in my life has actually come with serving my time in, in the military. Uh, I joined at 16. I was in junior leaders uh, regiment. Those who are of a certain age will know about that. You join up 16. Um, my birthday was in May. And in the June, as soon as I turned 16, in the June, June the 5th, I was in junior leaders regiment, raw artillery. Now, uh, in my troop, I was the only black guy uh, out of about 80-odd uh, 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 in, in my troop. And uh, there was one Asian chap. Uh, his name was Elvis. <laughs> that was his nickname anyway. My nickname, uh, funny enough, was Chalky. Uh, it was Chalky because of Jim Davison, given his Chalky. And also at the time, there was a song called Chalky's In Love or something like that. So my name stuck. I didn't really see any type of racial type connotations towards it because there are other black people in uh, the, the regiment at that time and none of them had any nicknames to do with their colour. Um, it was just a name what one of the sergeants said, called me and I didn't mind it. It stuck with me for about half of my military service, in fact, uh, because when I went to my man's regiment, some of the people in my troop uh, who I passed out with um, joined the same unit I had joined and they kept on calling me Chalky so the name just stuck and it was good uh, I jettisoned it when I went into the airborne because um, I just decided I, I was going to change or something I remember being 16 doing drill uh, and as we all had a fag break <laughs> even though we were all like 16, 17 one of the training, training sergeants said uh, who's going to get promoted in the troop back in junior leaders you have the junior promotions and unanimously everyone in the troop said Chalky is going to get promoted it was the first name what entered their head and I have to say that was one of the proudest moments of my life when your all your peers you, you know say you you're the person who is the leader I, I felt really chuffed and, and honoured when they'd said that however the sergeant snapped back and said that no nigger in my troop is ever going to get promoted. Well, my reply to him was short, sharp and swift. I, I said to him, my upbringing was a lot tougher than this training. I thought it was going to be a lot harder in the military than it is now. So I'm not really bothered. And also, I've just read Simon Murray's book, Legionnaire. And I think I might have joined the wrong army. Throughout my military uh, career, I did uh, experience racism, people calling me names. Uh, I remember uh, there was a chap who was a commander trained gunner who uh, pushed into me as I was on my way to the battery bar. And um, I didn't think nothing of it. And then I went to my room, having done my little uh, trip, my chore, buy my beer in my room. And the guy came in and started pushed me around saying, you know, why did I push into him? Which I thought was a bit strange. I hadn't pushed into him. Um, he then proceeded to start punching me. Now, at this point, I'd simply just come out of training. I didn't know what to do because when you're in junior leaders, it's like the uh, it's like the, the British Army's version of the Hitler youth in terms of the discipline, the rigidness, the traditions and everything like that. And the one thing what you are taught is to obey orders and respect, and respect your superiors. And this guy was a bombardier. Um, corporal to you guys uh, so I'm not sure how to retaliate so what I thought I'd do is I'd go down I went down to the guard room and as I went to the guard room this guy came chasing after me and at that point I did the only thing I thought I could do permissible was judo so I'd done a judo throw in him uh, and just went to the guard room and reported the matter now the next day I was up in front of the BSM battery sergeant major asking me, you know, what's this about you reporting being bullied? 
um, you know, by this bombardier. Uh, it was regarded, he, he, he had called me some racial names. And I explained to him what the situation was. I was 17 years of age. And the uh, battery sergeant major turned around to me and said, look, you know, it, it seems to be like it sits on one and half a dozen of the other. You know, make sure you don't do it again. And I'm like, at that point, I switched. And I said, listen, sir, if you think a 17-year-old is going to start pushing around and, and trying to attack a, a bombardier who's around 28, you know, that, that's not good. I said, the reason why I reported the matter was because I thought that military law was going to protect me. But what you're saying to me is that military law isn't interested. So therefore, I have to disregard military law as a form of protection and protect myself. So as of now, I will not be reporting anything. I will not be seeking military law. I will protect myself in any way which I think is appropriate. <laughs> he told me, Look, calm down. You don't have to take the law in your own hands. But no, I... I, I made it positively certain to him that that was the course I was going to take. And uh, I think over about a year, this bombardier always kept his distance to me, was always keeping his distance to me. And uh, it was always on edge and on tinders. And one time when I was doing my ironing, he put his head into the room and, and, and asked me to uh, come in when I finished. And I said, well, so and so's going to use the iron after me. He said, No, no, it's not about the iron. I thought, okay, right, this is it. We're going to have it out now. We're going to, this is this is where we're going to go toe to toe. This is where it's going to get completed. So I walked into the room and to my surprise, he said, Look, you know, there's no need to uh, you know, keep you know, at a distance, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, put his hand out and he shook hands. I thought, fine, okay. But I was deadly serious. If there was any assault, it was going to be done. And there would be nothing, no recourse on that. I had other experiences uh, when I was in Belize, Central America. Uh, for the whole of that six months, uh, everybody referred to the Belizeans as chimps. Black Belizeans, that it was. That was the nickname which was handed down through the different units that served in uh, Belize. Obviously, I found it very, very offensive, people using the word chimps in my presence. Uh, I had a good set of friends, and uh, we used to go downtown on the WAS quite often. I remember we went downtown on the WAS, come back totally wrecked, done what you used to do when you're wrecked, look for more beer. And I walked into the battery bar, and um, I went to ask for some beer, and some chap turned around to the other and looked at me and said, I don't think they should have uh, freed niggers either. And I just heard that. And I just said to him, well, what do you mean by that? I said, if you, if you want to make black people slaves, you better start with me. I was pretty drunk at the time. So as he stepped off his chair, I just took that as meaning he's been on the offensive. I dealt with him, dispatched him. And he smashed his head on the ground. He was unconscious. He had to be uh, helivacked back to um, airport camp at that time. And it was that point that um, the then Lieutenant Francis, who eventually finished uh, career as Brigadier Francis, uh, Lieutenant Francis said to me, you know, why didn't you tell me about all the problems about people, blah, 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 you know, sort of like chimps, blah, blah. I said, look, it's been going on for a long time. It's been winding me up. And he made a point, actually, of telling people they're not to be using the word chimp uh, in period, which was, I thought, I was very good, very fortuitous. Um, I'm just giving you little ideas about what racism is like, was like in the British Army. I remember uh, I had to do a jump with a battery, which <laughs> I didn't want to be with, quite frankly. I thought they were quite a bit of racist, but in true Army fashions, they actually put me in that battery and had to do a couple of jumps. And uh, one of the guys was saying that they weren't going to be checking my equipment and it was a night jump. I was pretty perturbed about it. Yeah. Uh, there was all different types of things. Literally, when I, when I left the um, army, there was a thing whereby uh, we, they were going to do a, like a, an artillery day for officers to teach Officers throughout the brigade, this is, this is back in the day, 
at uh, Five Airborne Brigade or whatever it was called. Um, it was about teaching officers about different uh, equipment and they were teaching them about the artillery and they were teaching them in particular about air defence. We were using a, we used to use uh, an air defence system called the blowpipe being converted to javelin. And uh, I'd been on uh, sort of tour and I'd come back and had a new troop commander. Previous troop commander was absolutely brilliant. This new commander didn't know what the score was with our particular uh, troop. And uh, he said, I want you, moi, to dress up as a Zulu and pretend that you're throwing a blow, but you're, you're, you're using a blowpipe in front of the whole brigade officers. Yeah, for the whole brigade officers. Now, I was really perturbed because I was destined to go out of the army. And as anyone know, you have to give a year's notice. And I was all sort of dependent on this bloke to be giving me a good write up, even though I didn't know him. My previous troop commander I knew really got on well, but this guy I didn't really know. And I told him that I was not going to be doing that. And he insisted because he didn't know who I was. Now, I was quite known within my troop. But he insisted that that's what I was going to do. I was going to dress up as a Zulu and do a blowpipe. I said to him, look, I, I, I don't think I'm going to do that, sir. And, you know, it seems a bit racist to me. He said, well, I asked, and he named, he named three other people. They were all black. <laughs> and uh, they had sort of declined, but they were uh, of ranks above me. I said to him, I ain't doing it. And come the time and the hour, uh, I stuck to my guns and I said, I, I'm not doing it. I don't care what report you write on my the whole career of the army. I'm not doing that. I was a bit stressed out at the time because, you know, a lot was riding on his report as he wrote my, you know, as I'm leaving, even though I didn't even know the guy. Um, his name was Lieutenant Thomas. I don't give a damn. Say the joke. That's who he was. And uh, anyway, he was saying, you know, you're refusing an order. You're refusing an order. And I'm like, it might be an order to you, but it's an illegal order. So I... Uh, I was marched in to the uh, battery commander, Major, uh, as though I was on orders, uh, saying that, you know, I'd refused to obey an order. And I told the battery commander straight, I've never disobeyed an order in my life. However, I believe that that order was an illegal order and I won't be doing it. It was out and out racist and I'm not doing anything like that. The uh, battery commander was saying, oh, didn't know what to think. And then he said, well, OK, look, we, we let it slide this time. But in the future, you know, don't go around disobeying orders. I said, sir, I'll obey any order as long as it's legal. I'm not, I, I, the reason I did not obey that order was because it was racist. I wasn't backing down on it. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, you know, I'm just these are a couple of little stories about the type of race and what I experienced in the British Army. Okay, good. So this lady who experienced racism, she's it's different for her because she was a woman. Okay, and it is very difficult as a man. Yeah, there was a lot. There used to be a lot of bullying in the British Army. Uh, those who were, can remember as far back, especially in training. You know, if you weren't up to scratch, you know, the instructors would uh, sort of hint and encourage uh, the people in the troop to give uh, somebody. Uh, a, a regimental bath yeah a uh, regimental bath is not a good thing you do not want to have a regimental bath so you make sure that your kit is up to scratch and you are very you know spick and span because a regimental bath ain't good at all uh, those who know what a regimental bath is please uh, put it in the comments okay um, so you know that with the woman it's difficult because as a man the way in which you respond to bullies is basically push back in their face and you just deal with it. And you're respected in the army for doing it. You're respected in most male organisations. It's a part of a weeding out process sometimes to bullying. Sometimes it's direct, sometimes it's indirect, i.e. sometimes it's consciously done, sometimes it's subconsciously done. Uh, but the way it's done is you, you push back and you, you tell them that you know, they're not getting, you know, you're not getting away with it. You're not going to be treated like that. It's difficult for a woman because the, the option of uh, physical violence isn't really open to them um, because they're more, not eight times out of ten, they're likely going to lose in that in that situation, that fight. 
So they are restricted. And that brings into questions women in sort of combat roles. And I don't think that women should be in direct combat roles. And if they are, then they ought to be with all women uh, groups. You know, it's, it's nonsense to have, you know, young, very fit male and females mixed together. It's, it's, it's disastrous. It can be very disastrous. I can talk about other elements uh, in that, uh, about that. Uh, but there is sometimes, I think, a problem in regards to all women groups because I think there's a higher percentage of uh, homosexual activity within those in that sort of environment. And I'm saying that only because I remember going to Ryan Darlin and a woman actually saying to me, Iraq, uh, a woman's Royal Army Corps, uh, saying to me that she wanted to leave the army because she was being bullied and intimidated by all the other girls because they all wanted to sleep with her. And when I told her to go report it to a sergeant, she said the sergeant's that way inclined too. I, I was, it was, it was, it was a discussion which was beyond my thinking because within a mountain environment, that 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 was very, I'd say rare, but it's something I, I never even heard of, to be honest. Uh, I never even heard of, uh, so I didn't really know what to say. Uh, but it was something noted that it seemed to be a hyper a propensity, if you like. Uh, for that within that sort of agenda if you like but so for for that that woman what she went through talking about the lynchings etc and putting stuff on her desk and that she, she should have just flipped really sometimes yeah you want to report it you know it was a failure of the command structure she should have felt safe enough to go to the command structure and say look this is what's happening it needs to stop and then the command structure to come in place Talk to the individuals concerned and tell them they need to straighten up their game, yeah, and stop that sort of stuff. In the absence of that, she could have just maybe thrown us uh, stuff over or used a bit of humour. Um, nowadays, people don't have much social skills, so if someone says something which is offensive, they're stuck. It's like, oh my god, I've got to go straight to the, the authorities. There are ways in which you can handle these things for yourself, uh, resistance, etc. Okay, that's that. Now. Now, I'm going to go on to something very uh, almost contrary, if you like, because uh, I did have a great love for the French Foreign Legion, and I had often thought about joining it. So much to with, uh, so much to uh, the. I mean, basically, we, I went on a tour uh, in a tour in uh, Falklands after the war. We were stuck up on the mountain for about four months, and the only thing we had was the only videos we had were First Blood and. Uh, uh, Legionnaire the documentary by Simon Murray and I was like we watched that about 40 times each and I swore I want to join the French Foreign Legion so much so that I was nicknamed Pierre and I tried to die my, I actually used a, a French parachutist beret as my exercise beret because it's the closest I could get to a Legionnaire's beret I was nicknamed Pierre for, uh, for a short period of time but what I was going to say is this uh, there was discussions about increasing the British Army. There was discussions about this lady and the racism, which was really about trying to introduce woke ideology into the British Army. Now, woke ideology has infected all the major institutions at the moment. It usually starts in academia. I'd like to talk about that. It happens in academia because you get a lot of Marxists uh, and socialists and communists, lecturers, and what tends to happen is, unless you've read Karl Marx and, and, and have a Marxist ideology, your essays are marked down, often marked down. And because they're marked down and you want them marked up, you will start reading Marx and looking at things through the prism of uh, communism or uh, Leninist or whatever, Marxist sort of ideology, so that you get good grades, yeah, in your essays. And therefore, there, therein is the part of the indoctrination, yeah? Uh, that's in the universities, but it seeped into uh, religion in the church. Notice the absence and silence of the church talking about uh, the uh, scandal of the uh, Olympic opening ceremony. There's no words. I've heard no words from Justin Willoughby uh, about about that. I've heard nothing from Justin Willoughby about what's been going on in Stockport, what went on with the, uh, the Lieutenant Colonel who's been stabbed. I, I don't know anything of what's been said by the church in regards to the, uh, the grooming gangs in Rochdale. Or Oldham, okay. Uh, this infestation of uh, woke ideology, as I said, has touched 
universities has touched the church, has touched within the high echelons of the mandarins within Whitehall, and obviously it's spread out into the army and definitely within the police. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's like an insurgency, but within itself, a cancer, if you like. So, I think you know what with uh, uh, Keir Starmer declaring war on uh, the working class, it was, it was unprecedented, really. He he was talking about the demographic which would traditionally vote for Labour, and he was holding them as uh, the enemy. Yeah, he has declared war, and it's a very serious matter, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think I've said it in the previous video. Some of some of the things are still with tongue in cheek, but the main thing at the moment, I think that people, Tommy Atkins, not Tommy Robinson, Tommy Atkins, yeah, the Rod R. Kipling uh definition of a British soldier. Tommy Atkins, that demographic should boycott joining the British Army. Let me repeat that. I say this heavily because I have a son, I'd love for him to join the army. But Tommy Atkins should boycott joining the British Army. Under no circumstances should they join the British Army because it's becoming woke and you will be controlled, okay, in that thinking. They've announced it. One of the, one of the uh, generals was saying, uh, he said, uh, what was it? So the, the, the working class mentality, uh, one of the former generals uh, in, in, the, uh, in the British Army was saying is, is, is a problem uh, with uh, what's going on in the army. Yeah, that's that's his own words. I would suggest that if you want action, if you want adventure, yeah, if you want a feel of camaraderie, yeah, you should go and join the most diverse army on the planet, the French Foreign Legion. You see, the irony of the French Foreign Legion is this. They don't have a problem with recruiting. They don't have a problem at all. In fact, they have to increase their standards to stay, to stave off the demand. And it's not, you know, you're competing not just against the, the so-called roads and the criminals and the people who just had their engagements broken off, but you're also competing against dissatisfied people who are in certain armies who just want to do something better than what they're doing. So the competition is very high and they don't lower their standards. So you'll get, you know, you join the French Foreign Legion, what are you going to get? You're going to get good military experience, number one. You're going to be a part of an elite unit, a special elite unit, which has allegiance not to the king, but to itself. It's very important. Your legion, your, your allegiance is with the French Foreign Legion. That makes things tight, okay? You'll learn a foreign language fluently. And you have the possibility of becoming a French citizen. So it's 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 quadruple bubble. It's quadruple bubble. And you'll be in adventure like nobody else's business. Yeah. Trust me on that one. Now, what what will be the what's the net effect of that? Well, when most people don't join, when that demographic does not join the British Army, it's either going to be filled up with another demographic, which will make the army weaker and incompetent, and so called put us at risk from external sources. But the, the fact of the matter is, we have an insurgency going on in our country at the moment. Yeah, we have an insurgency going on. And uh, we are doing nothing to stop that insurgency. In fact, when I say we, I say the government, they're doing everything to inflame it. Now, uh, some uh, people have been to, uh, watching that uh, Iranian chap saying maybe this is a deliberate thing to push people towards sort of a uh, you know, the Great Reset, you know, what was the cashless society, you know, the, the, the drill, the, you know, the nudge, nudge, wink, wink, uh, the nudging, if you like, of the, of the crowd in, in regards to the uh, the COVID situation and the vaccinations to see how far you can push it, they can push it, and then tailor, tailoring it uh, with these so-called riots which just sprung out of nowhere. They're shouting out Tommy Robinson, for example. I mean, yeah, Keir Starmer hasn't been in government for more than a month. And how many riots have we had in the country? How many people have been killed so far in this country by a set amount of dem demographic? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go by, don't go by protests. Yeah. Go by body count. Yeah. Let's go by body count when we report these things. 
And at the moment, the body count is very much skewed into certain demographics' favour. Don't get me wrong, I'm just talking facts, yeah? But we're being gaslit as to what is happening to us, okay? Being gaslit. And I'm not talking about just general Muslims, because seriously, I've got a lot of friends who are Muslims, a lot of respect to people in my neighbourhood, yeah? But these are not the people I'm talking about. I'm talking about these strange people who are coming into the uh, the mosques who don't come from Britain, who are preaching a certain type of ideology, of theocracy, yeah? And it's brainwashing those people to be anti-British. Uh, not even anti-British, just completely and wholly insular to the environment which they're in. Very much so. Uh, so I think that uh, we should boycott joining the British Army. If you want an adventure, join the French Foreign Legion. But boycott the British Army, number one. The second thing which I said, I've already said, is you need to start. Yeah, at the moment, there's a grassroots of people who are disenfranchised. But that grassroots are being labelled as far right by the mainstream media and, and the woke karate, if you like. It's, it's, it's a slur. It's an absolute slur on the working class, who were used to be called chaps back in the day. It's, it's bang out of order. But unfortunately, uh, for example, on the 27th of July, there was a very good march. It was very peaceful. It was very well organised, from my understanding. And that was done by uh, Tommy Robinson et al. Okay? But uh, what we see at the moment are people shouting out uh, Tommy Robinson's name in vain, uh, doing the very thing which that original march on the 27th and the 1st of June was going out of their way not to be. So I'm a bit suspicious about that, this constant charting and stuff like that. Uh, but unfortunately, that's a movement. It's a sort of grassroots movement. And as I said to you before, it's not aligned with uh, Nigel Farage. OK, uh, it's, you know, there, there, there are two movements going in parallel. And, you know, there's no political power from the base of, uh, let's call it the uh, Tommy Robinson et al. Yeah, there's no base there. Yeah, uh, and there's no political lobbying which is going on or going to be successful. What needs to happen is a focus on proportional representation. It's only when you get proportional representation that your vote matters. And it's only then that politicians will uh, listen to what you have to say because your vote will be correctly leveraged. At the moment, your vote is suppressed with the first past the post system. Yeah, if you want your vote to mean something, you go proportional representation. And just by having proportional representation, you will see the figures in participation rates go up, rise up, because you know that your votes mean something. So you need to be writing to your MP, number one, about putting it on the agenda. You need to be pushing it uh, to someone like Nigel Farage to make it a private member's uh, uh, motion, if you like, to have proportional representation. I think the uh, Social Democrats should be behind it because they're the ones who successfully managed to create a referendum for it. But at that moment in time, I don't think the British public were awake enough as to the significance of it. If you want to break the uni party system, which is the chokehold on our society, you need proportional representation. OK, right. I've said a lot. That's me over and out. Um, if you've listened to what I've had to say, thank you very much. Um, you know, like to have your comments and share. I don't know. This is a little channel, and uh, I hope it, at one point it does grow. Ooh, over and out.